Hello, this is Professor Ryan Paul, and thanks for joining me. Um, I'm going to talk about identifying reliable and unreliable premises in an argument. So the first thing, let's step back for a second and review what are premises in an argument. What, what are the premises? What do we mean? Well, the premises are what the author knows or thinks or believes to be true and wants us as the audience to accept as true in order to accept their conclusion. That is, the premises are the common ground. They're what the author of the argument is offering as, tr as proof, as reason to believe his or her conclusion. So again, there's the common ground between the different sides and perspectives or levels of expertise. The things that if we agree upon, and that's what the author wants, the author wants us to agree with, with them about the premises, then we should agree with their conclusion. The premises should necessarily lead us to the conclusion. So it's part of the whole purpose of arguing, right, is to lead you from what you know to something that you don't know. So we start with the premises. That's what we build upon. If they are true in a good argument, then we get to the conclusion. They lead us to the conclusion. Now, as I said, the premises are what the author of the argument thinks or believes to be true. And the author wants us, the audience, to also accept these premises, wants us to believe them. In fact, needs us to, to accept the premises in order to accept the conclusion. So there's a number of different types of premises or, or different, uh, we might say, levels of um, relationship or levels of connectedness to a premise or, or levels of knowledge that an audience can have about the premises of an argument that they're being presented with. So on the one hand, a premise can be something that you already know, that the audience already knows, already accepts as true. And those are the most, um, those are usually the strongest premises. If it's something that your audience already agrees with, then you've already got them partway on your side, and then you can use that to build to the conclusion. So those are the strongest types of, of premises, or, or maybe you might say the simplest um, and most obvious types of premises. There are also premises that might give information or ideas that are unknown to the audience, but you can demonstrate to the audience with some form of proof, uh, whether it be statistics, whether it be uh, measurements, observable evidence, uh, or through some sort of citation of an expert, right? Premises, some knowledge that the audience doesn't know, but you can demonstrate is true or is reliable, demonstrate that they should believe this and should accept it. Uh, and if you can do this well, then these are also good premises. These are also useful and effective in making your argument. And of course, a lot of times you will have to prove certain things to your audience. You don't just have to prove the conclusion, but sometimes you have to prove the premises upon which your conclusion is based. And finally, uh, we can think about premises that are unknown to the audience, unknown to your audience or not accepted already by your audience, and that are also not easily demonstrable. Premises that you cannot prove uh, or demonstrate the reliability or truthfulness of, either because there's no source or evidence to back up the premise, or because it's too vague, it's a broad statement that doesn't really mean anything, or because it's a statement that we can't know. It's beyond the realms of our understanding, beyond the realms of our knowledge. And these three different types of premises or three different levels of premises that I'm talking about, things that are already known and accepted by your audience, things that are unknown but demonstrable to the audience, and things that are unknown but not demonstrable to the audience, in a sense that also tracks levels of reliability levels of trustworthiness in an argument. And in a few minutes, we'll look at some of the problems from the homework and discuss exactly, uh, uh, give examples of these different types of premises and how we can use these ideas, use this, this, uh, uh, these measures, these qualities that I've been talking about as a way to determine if the premises of an argument are reliable or not. So now let's talk about that word reliability. What, what does it mean to be reliable. Let's think about if you have a friend who is a reliable friend. What does that mean? 
Well, that means if your friend says, I'll help you move this weekend, your friend will likely show up and will actually help you move. If your friend says, hey, I'll meet you at 10 a.m. tomorrow, then when you show up at 10 a.m., your friend will be there. Reliable means you can count on them. Now, is a reliable friend always going to be there? Is it possible that a reliable friend might occasionally let you down? Your normally reliable friend says, hey, I can give you a ride to the airport. And then when it comes time to go, they say, oh, sorry, my car broke down. Or, oh, sorry, I forgot that I had a test that I got to go take. Whatever it might be, there are occasions on which a reliable friend might let you down. Similarly, unreliable. Let's say you have an unreliable friend. This is the friend that always shows up late. This is the friend that's never where they say they're going to be. This is the friend that doesn't pay you back money, right? You can't count on them. You can't count on them to be there and support you. But just like the reliable friend might be unreliable once, might let you down once, the unreliable friend occasionally might actually surprise you and be reliable, might be there when you need him. You normally think, oh, I can never call Joe and ask him when I need help, but Turns out this time Joe actually shows up for you. Joe actually helps you out. So reliability and unreliability is not the same as true or false. Reliable, unreliable means can and should the audience put their faith in it? Is it something that the audience can believe in? A reliable premise could still be false. For a number of reasons, uh, either it could be uh, a commonly accepted fact at, at a time and that is then later proven to be false. For example, the idea that the um, sun revolves around the earth at one point in time, that was a completely reliable premise, but it was factually incorrect. By the same token, something can be an unreliable premise and still be true. For example, if it's something that has been proven by scientists, but the author of the argument doesn't actually cite the scientific research that's demonstrated uh, the truth of a certain idea, your audience might not have reason to, to believe that. They might say, that's an unreliable premise. I don't have any actual proof to take that premise as true. So reliability, unreliability is not the same as true or false. It's, can I trust this? Should I put my faith in it? Sometimes your faith is let down, right? Sometimes the bridge that you're walking across looks sturdy, but it's not, and it collapses into the river below. Other times the bridge is sturdy and you're able to walk across. So there's always a certain um, amount of faith involved, even in the most, uh, some of the most rigorous types of arguments, because again, reliability, unreliability, it's about not necessarily truth um, and knowing something for sure, but can you put your faith in it? So now let's talk about how do we measure the reliability of a premise. Um, and it's in a similar way basically to going through those different types of premises. The first thing we ask ourselves is this premise, is this reason given in the argument, is it a widely known and accepted fact or principle? Is it something that most people already agree upon and know to be true? For example, the earth is round. That's a commonly known and accepted fact. Murder is wrong. That's not a fact, but it is a commonly accepted principle. There's not going to be many people who are going to argue murder is right or they're going to disagree with that. Now, does everyone in the world believe that murder is wrong? Does everyone in the world believe that the earth is round? No. There are people who believe that the earth is flat or donut shaped or whatever. There are people who think murder is okay, right? But, so nothing is 100% when we talk about commonly accepted facts or principles. So you have to determine, one, who is your audience? Is this something that is going to be commonly and widely accepted to your audience? If you're writing to a general readership, you can probably count on most of them agreeing that the earth is round and that murder is wrong, right? So... There's no, nothing that's 100%. There is no fact um, or idea that every single person in the history of humanity agrees upon. But is it commonly accepted enough? 
is your audience, is this something that is generally going to be an uncontroversial assertion for most of the people in the audience of the argument? And again, that doesn't necessarily mean it's true. It just means it's reliable. The idea that the earth was flat, that used to be a reliable premise because everyone, quote unquote, knew that. Everyone knew that the earth was flat, so of course it's a reliable premise. We now know that's not true, so that's no longer a reliable premise. So something that may be reliable or commonly known or widely accepted today as a principle may not be commonly known or accepted as a fact or principle in the future. And some things that are commonly known and accepted now were not commonly known and accepted in the past. For example, the idea that women should be allowed to vote and that women have the same uh, uh, rights to vote as men. That was not always a commonly accepted principle. Um, that There used to be the principle that men, what was more commonly accepted, that men were rational, women were irrational, men should be in charge, women should be subservient. But that's not a commonly accepted principle any longer. So part of this, it, it's about audience. Also, the level of expertise of your audience is going to determine if something's commonly accepted or not. Let's say you're writing an article about, uh, I don't know, nuclear physics. The general audience, the general readership, most people in America don't know a lot about nuclear physics. So there may be a lot of facts that you would present, but they're not commonly known to the lay person, to the average person who's not a nuclear physicist. So you would need to provide evidence. Say, well, this uh, uh, radioactive material degrades at such and such a speed according to tests done at the MIT laboratory or whatever it might be. Um, according to studies at Johns Hopkins Medical Center, this type of radiation is especially dangerous, whatever it might be, right? The common reader doesn't already know that information, so you're going to need to provide them proof. But say you're writing an article about nuclear physics to other nuclear physicists. They already have a lot of this information. They already know a lot of these things. So things are going to be more, there are going to be certain facts and ideas that are going to be reliable to them, even without citation, because it's information they already have, right? You don't need to prove to a nuclear physicist um, that radioactive material breaks down over time. They already know that, but a high school student might not know that and might need to be given evidence or proof of that, some sort of citation. So reliability here in terms of what's commonly accepted also depends on the level of expertise of your audience. Now, a caveat or warning here about things that are widely known or commonly accepted. You want to beware of things that are vague terms or that are platitudes, truisms, things that sound reasonable but really are too vague to, to, to buy into. One example is from... Uh, the homework, the idea, a tr the statement, a true education is about more than just facts. That sounds like a reasonable thing to assume. That sounds like a reasonable belief and something that a lot of people might accept. But the problem is, what does true education mean? In a sense, this is a kind of a circular argument. A true education is about more than just facts. Well, what does true education mean? Well, a true education means something that's more than just facts. So what is it? It's more than facts. It's, it's kind of circular. It doesn't really tell us anything. It's not something that can be proven. It's just something that the author is stating and assuming as a vague sort of statement. So true education, uh, when you have very big, broad terms like that, uh, you want to beware and, and consider, let me define these terms. Do I actually know what these mean? And if they're too vague, if they're too broad, things like true education or human nature. Well, what is human nature? It's everything that's natural to humans. What does that include? Um, a whole lot, right? Uh, it's not something that can be defined easily. It's not something that everyone agrees upon. It's not something that even most people probably agree upon. So that would be an unreliable premise. On the contrary, let's take a premise like forcing children into prostitution is wrong which is a premise in one of the arguments from our homework. Now, some people 
got a little slipped up on this, and they said, well, this depends on your beliefs about prostitution. Some people believe that prostitution should be legal. But you want to be careful not to get, at the same time, not to get too picky or not to really ignore the entire context. Because that premise is not about whether prostitution itself is moral or immoral or about whether prostitution should be legal or illegal. It's about the idea that forcing children to be prostitutes is wrong. That's not a principle that you're going to have many people disagreeing with. That's something that's pretty widely accepted. The people who don't accept that are horrible monsters. So pretty much everyone is going to agree forcing children into prostitution is wrong. Again, is that a fact? Is that something that we can measure? No, it's not really something that we can factually measure in a mathematical way, but it's something that we as a society and as a culture have determined this is wrong. We do not accept this. So that is a good, pro uh, a good uh, premise, even though it might sound sort of broad uh, in a way that a true education is about more than just facts is not a good premise. Now, let's say you've got a fact that isn't widely known or a premise that isn't a widely accepted fact or principle. What do you do then? How do you determine if it's reliable? Well, then you look, is there support for it? Is there some sort of source, citation, evidence given to support that premise? For example, again, to go back to the idea of writing an, a paper on nuclear physics, if you state something about radioactivity or about nuclear fusion or nuclear fission, are you providing evidence to support that, that assertion? Are you uh, uh, showing the science? Right? Do you have a source, a, new, a, a reliable, reputable source to prove that information? Let's say you're making an assertion, you're writing an article about American history. Do you have documentation? Do you have um, arguments from expert historians, scholars in the field? If it's not something that's widely known or widely accepted, then it needs to have support. And then what you're really looking at is not whether the premise itself is reliable, but is the support given for it reliable? And that's when we get into things like expertise, training, um, that sort of thing. So if you're writing a paper, again, on nuclear physics, people that are going to be reliable are scientists, nuclear physicists, uh, people like that. People who are not going to be reliable are celebrities or random uh, conspiracy theorists on, on the blog, on a blog post, right? Those are not going to be reliable. So reliability here is more about the source. Are you given this information? Is it coming from someone that you can put your faith into to tell you the truth and to know the truth about this situation? If it's not, if it's something that is both not well known, not widely known and accepted, and there's no evidence uh, or no support, no citation given to back up the premise, then we're stuck at the level of unreliability. It's something that we can't put our faith in. And again, it might be true. It might be a scientific fact that's just not well known and the author forgot to put in citations for it or neglected to put in uh, support for that. It could still be true, but if we don't know it and we don't have any reason to believe it, then we have to say that's an unreliable premise. I'm not going to put my faith in it. I'm not going to step out on that bridge. I don't think it's going to hold my weight. Now, here you also want to be careful because, of course, sometimes experts can be wrong. And many times experts disagree with each other. So again, just because it's cited by an expert doesn't mean it's true, although that might mean that it's more reliable. We, can, we, we have more reason to put our faith in it, even though we might ultimately be wrong. Also, just because something has support, just because a citation is given, doesn't mean that the premise is reliable. Who is it that's supporting it? Who is it that's giving the information? Again, if you're writing something on medical health, if you're writing a paper on medical health, doctors, scientists, researchers are going to be much more reliable than celebrities, uh, uh, talk show hosts, uh, popular nutritionists or 
uh, diet uh, people who sell Jenny Craig diet plans, right? They're not going to be as reliable. So just because there's a source, you also have to think about what is this source's interest? Is their interest scholarly, academic? Is their interest in providing the truth? Or is their interest in selling you something? At the same time, just because someone is an authority, that also doesn't make them, uh, that doesn't make the, 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 what they've said true. Politicians make many statements. Just because someone is a politician, that doesn't mean we should believe them. Well, I believe such and such because the president said so. Is the president truly knowledgeable on that subject? Has the president studied it? Has the president consulted with experts? Uh, some presidents do, some presidents don't. So some presidents are more reliable than others. So just because there is an authority, right, we, also, we always want to make sure, is the authority themselves trustworthy? And again, um, people who have studied, people who are part of an ongoing academic or scholarly or professional um, discourse, conversation about a subject are going to be much more reliable than people who are speaking either based on personal opinion, based on personal or monetary interest, financial interest, or uh, people who are just trying to uh, uh, exploit power or control or get people to do what they want. Right. Those are all going to make someone much less reliable as a source. OK, now let's turn to the homework assignment, identifying reliable and unreliable premises. Um, I'll go through most of these, may not go through every premise and every argument, but um, we'll hit on some of the most important ones. So let's look at the first argument. Get out your homework assignment if you've got it uh, and follow along, please. Um, the first one, anybody could become a zombie, a relative, a friend, or even a neighbor. Zombies are constantly looking to eat the brains of the living. This is why you should always be prepared to escape from or fight back against a zombie attack. Pretty simple as an argument. First sentence is the first premise. Second sentence is the second premise. And then the third sentence is the conclusion. Now, are these reliable or unreliable premises? Many people said reliable. Because, yeah, we all know that that's what zombies do. They eat brains. And in all the zombie movies, um, anyone can become a zombie if they're bitten. But are zombies real? No, zombies are not real. Zombies do not actually exist. And even in zombie movies, they don't all eat brains. Some of them just eat flesh. So both of these are obviously unreliable premises. It can't be a reliable premise if it's fictional. Right. Everyone knows that Captain America uh, uses a shield and Thor a hammer and that if they. Fu well, no, no, that's fictional. It's not reliable. Right. So you can't make a reliable argument in the real world based on fictional premises of things that are not true. Let's look at the second one. Social networking sites have revolutionized the way we interact with our friends. Such sites allow people to stay in contact with hundreds or even thousands of people. Human nature, however, pre prevents us from having meaningful relationships with that many people. Therefore, most of your friends on those sites are not people with whom you have meaningful relationships. Again, fairly simple um, uh, uh, setup, very, very plain, very clear premises. And then the last sentence is the uh, conclusion. So here, what are the premises that are reliable? Let's take the premise such sites Social media sites, social networking sites, allow people to stay in contact with hundreds or even thousands of people. That's a pretty uncontroversial, widely accepted fact. That's just the way Facebook and various other social networking sites work. You can have hundreds, thousands of friends and attachments, right? So that's a reliable premise. It's a commonly accepted fact. The second premise, though, human nature prevents us from having meaningful relationships with that many people. What's problematic with that? A lot of people probably agree with that. I would say I probably agree with that statement. It's very hard to have meaningful relationships with thousands of people. But is it impossible? I, I Probably not. And again, the term human nature. Well, what is human nature? Human nature is what's natural to humans. So how do we know? Do we know what human nature is? No, we don't. We don't know what human nature is. That's why we still have psychologists and scientists and uh, why we do all sorts of philosophical study, because we're trying to figure out what human nature is. 
So we don't know what human nature is. We can't define it. It's such a broad term that it's essentially meaningless. So that's an unreliable premise because it's just something that we cannot know. Moving on to number three. Some people scoff at a liberal education as a waste of time, but a true education is not just about accumulating knowledge, it's also about educating one's emotions. A liberal arts education exposes students not only to history, science, and math, but also to the literature and arts that speak more directly to our emotions. Thus, a liberal arts education is an essential part of any real education. Again, simple uh, premise, premise, conclusion. Um, I would like to point out here the first statement, some people scoff at a liberal education as a waste of time, is neither premise nor conclusion. It's just extra context, right? The fact that some people scoff at a liberal education has nothing to do with the conclusion that a liberal education is necessary. You could cut that statement out and the argument would still function the same. So that first sentence is not even part of the argument. The first premise, a true education is not just about accumulating knowledge. Again, as I pointed out, that's too broad of a phrase. True education. Uh, it's, this is, statement is really begging the question, which means it's a sort of circular um, argument. It's already assuming the conclusion in the, uh, in, the premises, in the premises of the argument itself. We don't know what a true education is. And to say a true education is not just about accumulating knowledge, you're essentially uh, uh, defining it already. You're, you're, you're making an assertion and, and putting the conclusion into the argument itself. The statement, it's also about educating one's emotions. Again, too unreliable. Uh, not, not everyone would agree that that's what ed education is about. That's, I think, too controversial and broad a statement. So those first two premises are unreliable. They're just too vague. They're not things that we can know uh, and prove, and they're not things that are commonly accepted. Now, the third premise, a liberal arts education exposes students not only to history, et cetera, et cetera, but to arts and literature that speak more directly to our emotions. Is that reliable? Well, that's essentially what the definition of a liberal arts education is. A liberal arts education is an education that includes the sciences and math and history, but it also includes literature, philosophy, art, music, etc., etc. So that's just the definition of a liberal arts education. And I think most people would agree, even if they are not literature or art fans themselves, most people would agree that literature and arts speak more directly to emotions than science and math do, right? That's just what literature and arts are about. They're about speaking to our emotions, whereas science and math are about, have nothing really to do uh, necessarily with human emotions, um, even though many people, of course, do get very emotional and passionate about those subjects. So that is a reliable premise because it's essentially just stating the definition of a liberal arts uh, uh, education. Many people might find that to be unreliable because they think it sounds judgmental. They think it sounds like it's saying a liberal arts education or education in, in literature and the arts is better than history, science, and math. But that's not at all what the statement is saying. It's just saying that they speak more directly to our emotions. Number four, I won't read this one out, but this is the one about um, advanced life, advanced civilization in our galaxy. Now, there are some premises in this that are pretty obviously reliable. There are billions of stars in our galaxy. That's a pretty uncontroversial fact. Most people would agree and accept that there are billions of stars. Stars, Many of them probably have planets around them. I think that's also something that most people would agree on. We, we pretty much know that there are planets around many stars, that there are other planets um, in, the, in the universe. Now, the next two promises premises, excuse me, is where things get uh, unreliable. Some planets may develop life. Okay, some planets may, but also some planets may not. We have no way of knowing whether any other planets may or may not develop life. Me personally, I think that's it's quite probable, but I really have no way of proving one way or the other. I have no way of knowing one way or the other, so it's just a supposition. So it's not really a very reliable premise. And finally, some of those planets will probably develop intelligent life capable of producing advanced, civ advanced technology. 
because that's building on an already unreliable premise that the planets may develop life, this one is even more unreliable. This one is even more um, suppositional. It's even more of a far-fetched assumption. Yes, some planets may develop life, but even if they develop life, does that mean that they will also develop advanced technology that's um, as advanced as human technology or even further? That's a pretty big leap to make. Now, if this argument said there may be other advanced civilizations in our galaxy and this is why it's possible, then that would be a different thing. Then we can maybe say, okay, these are premises that we can't prove, but they're possible, so it is possible that there are other advanced civilizations in our galaxy. The problem here really is that the conclusion says there are. Because the author makes such a definitive statement in the conclusion, they need to have premises that match that. And the final two premises just don't have enough support behind them, enough uh, reliability for us to take them and believe them. Number five, I also won't read this one out. Uh, this is about radioactive materials. And the conclusion of this, it's, it's trying to prove that the Earth itself is at least 4 billion years old. Uh, in this one, there are various statements that are not actually part of the argument. Um, for example, the first statement, radioactive materials are materials that decay into other materials. That's not, uh, that has nothing to do, uh, you can cut that out completely, and that has nothing to do with whether or not um, the conclusion itself is true. The premises are the ones uh, that begin by looking at the ratios of radioactive materials to products of decay. We can estimate the age of a rock. And radiometric dating reveals that some large rock formations in the Earth's crust are up to 4 billion years old. Those are the two premises of this argument. Now, are they reliable or not? The question here depends on the level of knowledge of your audience. How many people know that you can measure the age of a rock by looking at how, by, by measuring the, the level of radioactive decay? Maybe that's commonly known, maybe not. Again, it depends on your audience. I would say that's probably n not that commonly known. So this argument, c even though it is a fact, this is a scientific fact, but it's not that commonly known. So it's slightly unreliable. It could be made more reliable if the um, author gave some sort of citation, some sort of evidence or explanation of how we know that we can date the age of rocks, uh, the age of the Earth, through radiometric dating. So that could use some sort of support. But it's not that um, outrageous of a fact, or it's not that strange of a fact. There probably are a good number of people who know it. I just don't know if I'd say it's commonly or widely accepted. And the second premise, radiometric dating reveals that some rock formations are up to 4 billion years old. That is probably an even less well-known fact, um, because that's not just about knowing about radiation, but it's about specific studies, about specific evidence that has been found. So that one definitely could use support. Uh, scientists working in Antarctica um, in the 1990s discovered rocks that appeared to be at least 4 billion years old, whatever it might be. But some sort of citation, because even though that is a scientific fact, it's not going to be commonly known uh, to most members of an audience, unless they are uh, people working in this field. So it needs some sort of support to make it reliable, to make it believable. Number six, uh, this is the one about scholars looking at the colonial period as a way of understanding economic development. So what are the premises that they, that they offer? The conclusion here is we suggest that inequality hinders, hinders economic development. One premise that they, uh, that they give is some of the colonies, some of the colonies established in America became economically successful while others have not. Let's think about that as a premise. Some have become successful, some have not become successful. Doesn't really give us a whole lot of information, does it? In a sense, it's kind of obvious saying that some people are successful while others are not. That's just true. Some people are old, some people are young. Some people are rich, some people are poor. Some people are happy, some people are sad. Doesn't really tell us anything except what we already know. There's another problem with that statement as well. Some of these colonies became economically successful, some have not. 
What does economically successful mean? And what exactly are the differences between the successful and the unsuccessful? Does economically unsuccessful mean it makes $1,000 a year less in product? 2000 a million? Just what is the difference in economic success? We don't know, so this is just too broad, too vague of a premise. The other premise given, the most striking difference between those that succeeded and those that did not, is that the successful colonies had much lower levels of economic and social inequality than the unsuccessful colonies. So, again, that might seem, and it's phrased in such a way that, that it seems persuasive, but, again, think about what information we're actually being told. It says the most striking difference is the, the levels of inequality. What are the other differences, though? Why is this one the most striking difference? The author doesn't give us any of that information, so we really can't tell. We don't know that this is the most striking difference. They're just saying this is the most striking difference. Maybe there are other differences. Maybe there's differences in the um, in gender equality. Maybe that's the most striking difference. Uh, maybe there's differences in climate. Maybe that's the most striking difference, right? Without the information and without some citation of according to such and such scholars e even, then this is just too vague of a statement again. And the other problem is it says... Uh, the successful colonies had lower levels of economic and social inequality than the unsuccessful, so we suggest that inequality hinders economic development. Well, what if it's the other way around? They're saying that the inequality is what's related to the development, but maybe economic development is related to inequality. That is, maybe it's not that the most successful colonies were originally the ones with the least inequality, Maybe it's that as they became economically successful, they became less unequal, right? So this argument is assuming cause and effect when we have no evidence to connect these two phenomenon in that way. So this is too vague, there's too many assumptions, and not enough definition, not enough information. Okay, number seven. This is the one about smallpox. Um, and we're given basically two premises here. The argument is that we're getting close to the day that polio will be eliminated. Um, and we're given two premises. The first is that by 1988, polio was only in six countries, Niger, Egypt, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria. The second premise says by 2006, two of those countries, Niger and Egypt, were polio-free, according to the World Health Organization. Now, what's the difference between those two premises? The first one says, in 1988, polio is only in these six countries. The second one says, by 2006, it was gone from two of those six countries. But the second premise gives us a citation. It says, according to the World Health Organization. And the World Health Organization is a reliable source for information about disease uh, and, and global endemics. So the first statement saying polio remained endemic in only six countries, maybe that's true, but we're not given any source. According to whom? Is that also according to the World Health Organization? It's not clear that the author actually has uh, uh, solid evidence that in 1988, only those six countries had polio, uh, still had cases of polio. But the second premise, that in 2006, Niger and Egypt were polio-free, we do have a reliable source for that, the World Health Organization, so that is a reliable premise. Number eight, this is a fun one, and this is one that a lot of people get tripped up on. Let me read it out. Despite what the skeptics would have you believe, many people are capable of seeing ghosts. Ghosts are real, and anyone with the psychic ability known as extrasensory perception is capable of seeing them. ESP is a real phenomenon, according to Professor Joseph Ryan of Duke University. In fact, about half of all people have ESP, although many never realize it. So first, what's the conclusion? Or what's the premises here? What are they trying to prove? That 
the argument is trying to prove that many people are capable of seeing ghosts. So what's the, what are the premises? One premise is that ghosts are real. Is that a reliable premise? Many of you might believe in ghosts, but it's not a reliable premise. Despite all the TV shows of ghost hunters and whatever, there's actually no evidence, and there never has been any evidence, of ghosts ever. There are things that people say, well, I don't know how to explain this or how do you explain that, but there's no actual evidence, documentation, proof of any sort in the history of the world that ghosts exist. So saying ghosts are real is a bad premise. It's very unreliable because one, maybe some people, and maybe even a lot of people might believe that, but it's certainly not something that's uncontroversial. It's certainly not something that is a widely and commonly accepted fact. At least, I hope it's not. And the premise, anyone with a psychic ability known as extrasensory perception is capable of seeing them is really, uh, is, is problematic for the same reason. It's just asserting that something exists ESP that allows you to see ghosts uh, and it's building on the assumption it requires the assumption you accept the assumption that ghosts are real so this is getting even further from reliability now let's look at this third premise and this is one that a lot of people um, get tripped up on ESP is a real phenomenon according to professor Joseph Ryan of Duke University well there it's a professor at Duke who's saying that ESP is real doesn't that make this a reliable premise because it has a professor at a university? So it's not even just like some random person. This is an academic. Well, the first thing we have to ask is, what is Joseph Ryan professor of? There is no such thing, despite what the Ghostbusters movies would have you believe, there's no such thing as parapsychology or paranormal research in universities. There's no department of paranormal research. So there's no way that Joseph Ryan is an expert on ESP. There just don't exist any people who study ESP at universities in a scientific way. So even if this professor said that, he's not in any position to actually prove that. He could be a professor of English. He could be a professor of engineering. He could be a professor of economics. He could be a professor of art. He doesn't actually have any expertise to demonstrate ESP because there is no such thing. There, is, there are no professors of ESP. So this is um, what we call the appeal to authority. It's just saying, oh, look, this authoritative person who seems impressive is giving us evidence, is supporting this. So because they said it, I'll believe it. But here, it's, it's, uh, it's a shell game. It's a trick. It's a smokescreen. Because again, there are no experts in ESP. And then the final premise, in fact, about half of all people have ESP, although many ne never realize it, just doesn't make any sense. How can you have a sense and not know that you have that sense? Are any of you unaware that you can see? Are any of you unaware that you can hear? Right? If you have a sense, if you perceive something, then you know you have that sense. If you can see, you know you can see. If you can smell, you know you can smell. If you had extrasensory perception that enabled you to see ghosts, then you would know that you had it. So people can't not realize they have it. So this whole argument is just garbage, basically. And I hope you were able to f figure that out on your own. But if not, right, what probably tripped you up is just the confidence with which this argument is stated. It sounds very confident. Ghosts are real. Many people are capable of seeing ghosts. Okay, but there's no proof behind that. Just because it sounds persuasive and just because the author sounds convincing doesn't mean it's true. Let's look at number nine. You should be a vegetarian. That's, that's the author's conclusion, trying to get us to be vegetarians. So what are the premises that they offer to get us to become vegetarian? One, every time you eat meat, your meal is the result of the suffering and death of an animal. Is that reliable or not? Well, certainly every time we eat meat, an animal has died. There's no surgical removal of meat from animals and then served to us. Anytime you're eating meat, it's from an animal that's dead. Does that necessarily mean that the animal suffered? Probably, if it was killed in the United States, uh, we should be aware that you know factory farming in the United States is, is quite brutal and quite inhumane. So it's quite likely that the animal suffered, but it's not necessarily true. It is possible 
that an animal was killed uh, in such a way that it did not suffer, that it was not aware of its own, uh, that it was not aware that it's going to die. Uh, that's not very common, but it's, it's possible. So I would say this premise is basically reliable. It's not entirely reliable, but it's basically reliable. A lot of people get tripped up on this because they say, well, do we know that animals feel pain? Maybe that suffer, maybe animals don't really feel pain. No, we know that animals feel pain. There's, there's no question about that. Um, that's pretty well scientifically established that animals can feel pain. Most animals at least can feel pain. Maybe not fish, supposedly, but certainly cows, pigs, sheep, um, all the uh, land uh, bearing uh, chickens, all the land, uh, uh, land loving animals that we eat, they can all experience pain. Again, is it necessarily true that they suffered? Mm, not necessarily, but it's still probable. So I would say that first premise is basically reliable. The second premise, it's disgusting to put a piece of a dead animal's carcass into your mouth and chew it. Is that a reliable premise? If you like to eat meat, then you would say, no, it's not a reliable premise. This is just a subjective, a subjective statement. Some people might find it disgusting, but obviously people who eat meat don't find it disgusting. So it's not a very reliable premise. It's also not very persuasive to say, hey, that thing that you like doing is actually disgusting. Well, I like doing it. I don't find it disgusting. So saying it's disgusting to, to eat a dead animal's carcass, that's not a reliable premise. It's too subjective. Premise three, there's plenty of great vegetarian food, including tasty meat alternatives. Now, that's a tricky one for a lot of people because people get caught up in their own personal opinions. Me personally, not a huge fan of much vegetarian food. Don't like a lot of vegetarian food. Does that mean I think there's no such thing as good vegetarian food? No, obviously there is. I obviously realize that other people like vegetarian food, that they find it tasty. Even though I don't find some of this food tasty, that doesn't mean I'm going to deny that it exists. So whether you are a vegetarian or not, whether you think vegetarian food is tasty or not, it's an undeniable fact that there is vegetarian food that is good, that is quality food. There is vegetarian food that, uh, that are alternatives to meat that many, many people find tasty. So that is, I would say, a reliable premise, even though it is also somewhat subjective because it relies on you finding something that you like. But again, just because you eat meat, um, it's really, it'd be in bad faith to say, well, there's no such thing as good vegetarian food because I don't like any of it. That's just as subjective as saying it's disgusting to put a piece of dead animal's carcass into your mouth. So there's plenty of great vegetarian food. Yeah, that's a reliable premise. Premise four, vegetarianism is healthier than eating meat. Is that true or not? Well, the statement is a little bit too vague. Let's say all I ate were potato chips. Is that healthy? It's vegetarian. I'm not eating any meat. I'm just eating potato chips. Not a very healthy diet, though. So vegetarianism in itself, that is just not eating meat in itself, is not necessarily healthier. You would have to eat a healthy vegetarian diet in order for it to be healthier than eating meat. And it can be very tricky because there are some things that you get in meats that are very important and that are much harder to get through a vegetarian diet. But, of course, it is entirely possible to live a completely healthy, a very healthy vegetarian lifestyle. It probably is much healthier than you than eating meat, certainly than eating a lot of meat, as much eat meat as we eat in the United States. But vegetarianism is not necessarily healthier than eating meat unless it's a healthy, well-managed, nutritional vegetarian diet. So premise four, too vague. And finally, premise five, one more reason to be a vegetarian is that you'd be joining the company of a long list of incredible people Leonardo da Vinci, Isaac Newton, Thomas Edison, Paul McCartney, Shania Twain, Tobey Maguire. So one thing, um, the question here is, how well known is it that all these people were vegetarians? Uh, I may, might be pretty well known that Paul McCartney is a vegetarian. He was pretty vocal about, uh, about his vegetarianism when he um, became a vegetarian. But does everyone know that Isaac Newton or Thomas Edison were vegetarians? These, this list of people is just too, um, it, it's not well known enough. It's not commonly known that all these people are vegetarians. 
Although, so that's one thing about it that makes this premise unreliable. The second thing that makes it unreliable, and in my opinion is, is more important, is who cares? Right? Who cares if these other people were vegetarians? That really has nothing to do with whether or not I should be a vegetarian or not. Because someone could say, well, you shouldn't be a vegetarian because here's a list of bad people who are vegetarians. It doesn't matter if a good if a person is vegetarian and they're good, if a person is vegetarian and bad. It doesn't have anything to do with whether you should be a vegetarian or not. So I would say that last one, it's unreliable, not only because we don't necessarily know that all these people are vegetarians, but it's not important whether they are or not. It has nothing really to do with whether or not you should or shouldn't become a vegetarian. Okay, so let's look at the final one, number 10. The Bureau of Justice Statistics reports that at least 300,000 children in the United States are forced into prostitution and other sex trafficking crimes every year. They estimate the average age of entry into forced prostitution is 12 years old. Forcing a child to work as a prostitute is wrong. It is a travesty that eliminating child prostitution is not a bigger, a bigger priority for our country. So fairly standard, uh, fairly simple, clearly laid out argument, premise, 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 conclusion. Let's look at the premises. The Bureau of Justice reports at least 300,000 children in the U.S. are forced into prostitution every year. That's a fact that's given to us, and it's given with support, the Bureau of Justice Statistics. So that's given to us with a reliable source, uh, a reliable citation. Most of us probably don't know that number, wouldn't know that fact off the top of our head, but this argument gives us a source that we could go to to double-check, a reliable source, someone that we can put our faith in to know the truth and give us the correct information on the subject. And the second uh, premise, they estimate the average age is 12 years old, is reliable for the same reason, because it's from the same source, right? So it's uh, a fact given to us from a reliable source, uh, a trustworthy source. The third premise, forcing a child to work as a prostitute is wrong. As I said before, even though this isn't a fact, that is, it's not something that we can prove with measurements or something like that, it's a principle that I think most people would agree with. Most people are going to say, no, we should not force children or force anyone to work as prostitutes, but certainly not forcing children to work as prostitutes. So whether or not you think prostitution should be legal or not has nothing to do with whether or not this premise is reliable or not. It is reliable because it's a commonly accepted principle. We should not force children to be prostitutes. That's wrong. So all the premises thus far are, are reliable. And now we get to the conclusion. It is a travesty that eliminating child prostitution is not a bigger priority for our country. And that's this, this last one is actually the, the, uh, the odd one in terms of the, um, the argument because it's the conclusion that is unreliable. The argument proves that there is a problem with child prostitution in the United States, that there's a large number of children being forced into prostitution, and it gives us a very clear assertion, a moral assertion that, that many of us would probably agree with, that hopefully all of us would agree with, uh, that it is wrong to force children or anyone to be a prostitute. But does that prove that it's not a big priority for our country to eliminate child prostitution? Mm. That's where it's questionable. The premises here are reliable, but they don't necessarily prove the conclusion. They don't prove that it's not a big priority. Maybe it is a big priority. Maybe the number 300,000 is down from 500,000. Maybe it's down from a million. Maybe next year it'll be even less. Maybe there have been all sorts of uh, initiatives uh, uh, started to prevent this from, from occurring. So... Just showing that it is a problem doesn't prove that we are not taking it seriously as a problem. So, let's just review. Reliability, unreliability. Doesn't have to do with what's true or false. It has to do with, can you put your faith in it? Can you believe in it? Is it something that you, if this was a bridge across a river, would you trust it to put your weight on it and walk across the bridge? Or would you say, I, I don't know, I think that bridge is going to collapse under my weight. That's what reliability and unreliability is about. Sometimes you're wrong, but 
this is the best you can do, right? Because we can't always know what's definitely true or false. Reliable premises are those that are commonly known and accepted and that if they're not commonly known and accepted, that are supported by a reliable, trustworthy source that has the knowledge and expertise to tell the truth, to give us reliable information. If a premise is unknown and unprovable, if it's too vague, if it's uh, uh, if the source is not a reliable source, if the experts are not a reliable experts, if it's unknown and unknowable, these are all reasons why the premise would be unreliable. So you have to think carefully because it's not about what sounds reliable to you. You have to go through a, a not a very complex, but a certain thought process of testing out. Do I know this? How do I know this? Am I given reason to believe this? Are the reasons that I'm given to believe this good? Are they reliable? If you can answer yes to all those questions, then you have reliable premises. And hopefully then, if the argument's well constructed, it leads to a reliable conclusion. So that's the end of our talk on reliable and unreliable premises. If you have any questions, of course, feel free to contact me. Otherwise, I wish you the day you wish yourselves, and I will see you in the next presentation.